Steve Silver's Beach Blanket Babylon is proud to present a special performance for Google. And now, Steve Silver's Beach Blanket Babylon. To tell the story of a very famous show. It's the longest running musical review on the planet. And it started up the road in San Francisco. Now, the storyline is simple. I'm going to help you all understand. It's about Snow White trying to find her prince. My job is to help her with her plan. It's got big hair, big hats and costumes That's kinda how the show began And it was created by the genius Steve Silver One incredibly talented man One night a bunch of us were out at dinner and we came outside the restaurant and there was a guitar player, people were throwing coins at him, and I said, hey, wait a minute, let's go back to my house, put some costumes on that I had from rent freak and come back and do an act, see if we can make some, some money. So we went to my house, got the costumes on, came back, wrote the show from my house to the restaurant. We started singing Close to You by the Carpenters and some really crazy stuff, and people started throwing us money. We made 25 bucks. That was when I really started understanding what people wanted, what kind of entertainment people wanted. And later that year, I decided I'm going to do a show. Maybe a crazy show. Yeah, for sure, a crazy show. And um, Open Beach Blanket right up here on, uh, on Grand Avenue at the Savoy Tivoli in 74. And then, let me see, when was it? June of 75. June of 75, opened up Beach Blanket Babylon Goes Bananas at Fugazi Hall, right here on Green Street. Oh, in the beginning days, I did all the hats. I would design them, and then I would make them. And I, I don't know how to sew. I just kind of glued it all together and stuck things in styrofoam and prayed, cross my fingers. I love to create a show. I love to draw the costumes, and I create really through my drawing pad. And I put something on stage that I think is dynamite. There's no way this thing is not going to work. I love editing. If I say an idea or somebody else says an idea and we all laugh, we know it's pretty sick. I mean, you know, if you knew sushi, if you knew sushi like I knew sushi, you know, not a stock idea you know, but kind of sick. One of my all-time dreams years ago was to produce a show with Annette Funicello. It was impossible to get Annette Funicello. People said, you'll never get her. And of course, when people say you can never get anything, you can never do it, that's when I try harder. And I, I knew I'd get Annette in my show. In my mind, Annette Funicello was a star. And she was so great to work with.
Just give me dead man walking. This merry widow's got a new beat. You gotta have the Oya if you want them on their I think that's what people want to see today. I think they want escapism. I think they want to see something fun where they can laugh and have a good time and not worry about all the, the terrible stuff they read about in the newspapers. So in our own little way, we're doing something to help the world. We're doing something to make it a little bit more joyful. San Francisco, open your door and to let the stranger wait outside your door. San Francisco, here is your wandering one, say I want to know more. Once upon a time, there was a young girl looking for her prince, and her name was Snow White! Someday my prince will come, someday I'll find a true love, and the birds will sing, and when Politicians, pop culture icons too, for you see. Our show is topical, incredibly topical. When something is in the news, we know what to do. We just Google it, you know. Then suddenly we take flight, and with all our might, that night it is in the show. We're just topical, fanatically topical. You'll hear a familiar tune sung by Kim Jong-un or see Vladimir Putin strut. Or just wait, you might see Kim Kardashian's butt. Because you know she's all about that bass, about that bass, no treble. She's all about that bass, about that bass, no treble. She's all about that bass, about that bass, no treble. I'm all about that bass, about that ba bass, 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 bass. Yeah, it's pretty clear. I ain't no size two. But you can shake it, shake it like you're supposed to do. Cause I got that boom boom that Kanye likes to chase All the right junk in all the right places Now in this magazine there was no photoshop Cause every part is real from the bottom to the top 
Now I'm not dumb. Best you don't forget this greasy rump of roast smoked the internet. <laughs> I'm Mickey Azalea, the new girl on the map. Though you may not know who I am yet, hell, I don't give a crap. I'm the hottest Australian sensation, so watch me strut. But unlike me and Nicki Minaj, you ain't got no butt. <laughs> Spicy as Gorgonzola, the junk in my trunk could resist Ebola. B to the A to the N to the G to the A. B to the A to the N to the G to the A. Here's to the booty girls, we do it well. Now give it up for my sister Adele. Yes, and 
and here we are in a heaven for you want Thank you guys for showing up. Welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Kevin Balk. Thank you guys. One more round of applause for Steve Silver's Beach Blanket Babylon. That is just incredible. You know, I, I came from Chicago three years ago into San Francisco, and one of the first things that people tell you to do is see Beach Blanket Babylon. You know, and as soon as you get here, I, I kind of put it off for a while, and then I finally saw it. And at first, I thought it was going to be like Second City in Chicago or SNL, but this is crazy like it's way more fast paced and the costume changes and the hair and, and just how, how do you guys you know make it topical and current like what are the struggles with with just making it incorporating into a show that seems like it's already very streamlined 
Well, our producer and our director, our producer Joe Schumann Silver and director Kenny Maslow, are really good at staying up on the times, and uh, they listen to us too, and we want to do something too. And it just, it really is Joe and Kenny who, when something happens, you know, they put it in the show that very night. And are there any, are there any numbers or ideas or stuff that you have that are limited by the size of the hats? Like, oh, this would be a great idea to incorporate, but we just don't have the time. Well, it's, we were putting in like a tap number and w they were going to put it in the Brazil number. And if you've seen it, Brazil has a ton of huge hats. So sometimes when we try to put something in, the hats are so large that maybe a dance number is not the best thing to have. <laughs> so I think in that way, they have to really consider, you know, what's going on, what's on your head and can we do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, and thank you for the specially created Google hat. That was incredible. Really, really cool. So, uh, you know, creating that, creating the hats just in general, is it, is there kind of like a template you guys, that the creators and the designers use, or is it just completely free, start from scratch every single time? Well, it starts from scratch, but um, we all wear things that are called buckrams. They're designed to fit our head exactly. Like, a lot of us wear our hair in buns or pinned up, and then you wear a wig cap, and then they've made this kind of paper mache buckram over it that fits your head directly and then they start from scratch and build you know the most amazing wigs it's incredible uh is there a trick to keep them on your heads stand up straight <laughs> <laughs> lots, your, and lots, lots of, of fittings to get the weight right yeah yeah keep your neck really strong and what happens is, i remember the first time i put on a wig it was like <laughs> <laughs> You're like trying to follow it, but after a while, your neck muscles get really strong and there's no problem. You don't even realize you have anything on your head anymore. You're like <laughs> clearly turning the way you're supposed to or something, but when you first get it, you're like... <laughs> <laughs> now, is there, is there ever a backup plan for when a hat goes wrong or a, a bum? <laughs> well, it's live theater, so anything can happen, and some of our best moments come from rolling with stuff that happens on stage. Uh, you know, it's, it's live theater when a show goes this long. You're bound to have exciting moments, and we all just, we just, we love that, you know? It's, we totally live for it. Yeah. <laughs> Keep, keeps it fresh, keeps it new. <laughs> now, are there any, uh, you know, every once in a while there's always a like pop cultural reference that happens in the news and, and everything, so when do you determine kind of how long that stays in the show and if it's appropriate, and does anything ever get pulled from the show? As long as people laugh, they keep it in. You know, it's, if people are still laughing four or five years later, it stays in. <laughs> It really, it's the audience that determines what we put in. Even we've tried things before and it kind of didn't go over. So we, you know, put something else in its place to keep it fresh for the audience. That's why they come to see all the new stuff. Oh, I saw this on the news yesterday. I wonder if it's going to be in Beach Blanket, and it probably is. Because <laughs> yeah, there have been whole numbers that we've worked up and choreographed and costumed and everything. We tried it for one show, didn't go over, didn't go in. Oh, really? <laughs> I'll never forget, too, the costume designers when Kate Middleton and Prince William got married. They literally made that wedding dress in a day. Like, <laughs> overnight, as soon as she walked down the aisle, they had to start working on it. And that night, she was in a full-on gown in the show. Replica of the dress, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and do each of you have kind of your favorite reference that you've been a part of or seen in the show? There's so many good ones. I think ones that are not in the show now that I really miss is uh, Yokohama number, and you know it's set to the tune of Oklahoma. You know, Yokohama, where the wind comes sweeping down the plains. So I, I really miss that one. I mean, there's so many good ones, but that's my favorite. I think. Go ahead. Shall we go? Okay. Um, go my favorite. I'm lucky. I, I understudy four different guys in the show, so I get to do everything. And my favorite bit that I do now is Michelle Bachman. <laughs> The guy, there's not a lot of drag in the show, but the, it, it's done for comedic effect sometimes. Like the Queen of England is played by a guy and Michelle Bachman's done by a guy. And, yeah. <laughs> I've been really enjoying um, our Putin on the Ritz number uh, with Vladimir Putin. I laugh, I'm in the corner and I'm kind of glad I'm in the dark because uh, I'm just laughing the whole time. It's just such a good time. I haven't gotten to do Putin yet. I'm waiting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I play the pineapple princess and it's one of the original characters that have been in the show for many years, so I love that one. But I always laugh to myself because I literally get paid to shake my butt. And I've been pay playing Kim Kardashian for about five years now, and this, she won't go away. So <laughs> this was the, the newest costume, and we've tried it, and of course, I'm just bearing it all out there. So, <laughs> you know, it's fun, it gets a good laugh. I think my favorite is Tina Turner. I wear a wig, it's about this tall, kind of looks like Cousin It. And uh, I get to shake and twitch and kind of act a little zany, so I think that's my favorite. 
Um, my favorite is Barbara Streisand. She is there all the time. She's not going away. Um, <laughs> nor why would she? I mean, she's amazing. So that's kind of fun. I have really long fingernails and I'm cross-eyed the whole time. And I didn't know how to be cross-eyed when I first started for some reason. So I remember my roommate and I like studying, going, you know, trying to make myself go cross-eyed. Um, and then we were actually just talking backstage, the silly, silly number. But I don't know if you guys remember years ago, Marie Osmond on uh, Dancing with the Stars, when she fainted, like randomly she's being interviewed and she just like falls down. And that was just, it's just those like silly things that are just a moment in TV history, yet it's such a funny bit, and we're dancing, and I just faint, and then they sing, poor Marie Osmond lies on the floor, you know, I mean, it's just, it's too, it's too good, so. Now, do you guys get to come up with ideas, too, when you see something that interests you and kind of have some influence over your characters? Oh, yeah. I, I think Shauna comes up with a lot of really good ideas. Um, well, we all were like, you know, Joe is awesome. She emailed us before New Year's. We do a big new New Year's thing, and I think all the girls were like, we booties, man. <laughs> You're the booty. <laughs> One of the guys in the show has been campaigning for Putin on the Ritz for years, and so it's, we're glad it's finally yeah. in. <laughs> That's great. And uh, what are some of your backgrounds in terms of uh, theater or improv or... Um, well, Shauna and I actually went to college together. We both went to UC Irvine, Southern California. So she started working here. We were musical theater majors, and she started working at Beach Blanket. You're a couple years older than me, so she worked a couple years before I did. And then she's the one who kind of got me. I had grown up in the area, so I grew up. I went to my 21st birthday party was at uh, Beach Blanket, actually. <laughs> so that was kind of fun, you know. But, um, but yeah, so it was, it was really fun to kind of come full circle, and we had another UCI guy working there, too, so it was really fun. I think uh, it's a lot of theater background, but we all have dabbled, I think, in other things. I know I spent six years in New York. I know Caitlin did as well. So you kind of go, and here what's nice about it is that it's, you know, I mean, the show's been running for 40 years. Seemingly will run for another 40. So as far as I can see, as long as I can stand up and sing, I have a job. <laughs> so, and I get to go home to my family and not, you know, and have my kiddo go to a great school, you know. So to me, it's like, I can't believe I'm the point zero 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 one percent of people who gets paid to do this for a living. And as wacky as it is, it's so fun. It's 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 incredible and fun to watch. I think that's the thing too, is why the audiences keep coming back. Now, in you know the forty years, how have you seen the show just evolve in general, other than the pop culture updating and stuff? Have you seen the show evolved? Ooh, yeah. I mean, for sure, it, it has taken sort of a natural because the times change and th interests change. You know, I mean. We still have a lot of old-fashioned references, but we're really topical. I mean, I know that's as cheesy as it sounds in that song, but we keep everything really fresh all the time. So the show has to naturally change. And with know? the internet, and I mean, nowadays, it seems that the show has gotten so fast because we have everything at our fingertips on YouTube and Google. And we, I mean, it's, it has to move. I think the difference too, like I started 10 years ago, there was a lot more time to change your clothes. And nowadays, it's like people have ADD. Like you gotta move on to the next <laughs> thing. So the show has gotten really fast. But I think one of the things that I really appreciate is that Joe and Kenny have a tendency to keep the iconic Steve Silver, Beach Blanket, Babylon icons in the show. So Planner Peanut, Pineapple Princess, um, King Louie, Barbara, King Louie, they're still in the show, but they're topical now. So King Louie is singing about something that, you know, is appropriate and applicable yeah. to today. Planner's Peanut is carrying an iPad, you know, so <laughs> yeah. it's, it's fresh, but it's still, you know, paying homage to where we started 40 years ago, which was with Steve Silver and this great idea that he had. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a really a Bay Area institution and, you know, anyone who comes here really has heard of it. So has that really helped kind of have your permanent home here and help kind of shape the show and just to be like, this is a complete iconic thing when you come to San Francisco, this is the thing to do? Well, yeah, you know, it's, I'm sorry, you know, it's funny. I'm just going to interject because we were talking in the dressing room. This is the first time that any of us can remember doing a PR where we did not sing San Francisco. <laughs> it's, it is such an ingrained part of what we do, and it's, it, it really does, as you say, shape the show and shape the, the themes and the, the methodologies that are in play. It's because of this unique and fantastic city. I'm sorry. And, and I was just oh. going to say that you know, we're in all the travel books now as far as, you know, when you go to San Francisco, it's right there. That's one of the attractions. You come see our show, yeah. 
And I can't say how many times, and it's really touching, I've seen when we're, we are singing San Francisco at the end of the show, for whatever reason, you don't know their story, but there might be someone in the audience and you'll see them sort of like wiping tears away, but they're smiling, they're so happy, so maybe they've moved away and they've come back or they're visiting or so there's some, there's something, you know, touching them about it. And it's just, it's really lovely to see because we touch people every night while we're performing and it's like, it, that's why we do what we do, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do some audience questions, too, so if you guys want to come up to the mics, feel free. Um, you know, I realize there's a, there's a matinee show that allows, actually, people who are under 21. So does the show change there, too? Yeah, for instance, a little bit. On, on a Sunday, I will not unveil my butt, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, a, just a few little things that we change so we're not, like, saying curse words. Or there's a very iconic uh, banana hat that comes out. And he lets his banana up in the regular show, but on the matinees, the banana does not go up. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right, we have a couple audience friendly questions. Friendly How about you? Sundays. That was a great show. Thanks for coming here to delight us. Um, what's, <laughs> what's, what's your creative process for coming up with the new songs, and how long does it take you to... To learn the new lyrics and present them. That would be Kenny, Kenny, and, Kenny. and Joe. Well, and Kenny let us not forget Bill Keck, <laughs> and Bill our Keck, composer. Our amazing musical yeah. director. I mean, he puts together all these segues of tons of songs that everyone knows all in one number, and it's just incredible. And so he and Kenny collaborate on that. Sometimes it's really fast if they're really trying to get it in the show, like right away. Um, you know, Kenny will come up with with a number. Kenny and Joel write a number like overnight. Uh, so it just kind of depends. If it's a number with a lot of people and costumes, it takes a little bit longer. A lot of times they'll have us try like a line in the show, see how it goes, if it gets a really good reaction. Like as Snow, I used to have like a Justin Bieber crotch grab and it was really funny. And then we put, okay, it's time to put Justin Bieber in the show, you know? So we kind of, they'll gauge it and sometimes we'll just put a whole number in and see how it goes. Thank you. <laughs> how about you? Um, again, thank you so much for coming. This is, would be my fourth and a half time seeing you, so it's pretty great. <laughs> um, I was just curious, we've mentioned um, numerous times that the show is so topical, and so you're obviously adding costumes in and different ideas. Um, what do you do with the costumes that are retired? And there is a big, beautiful land called the Beach Blanket Babylon Warehouse. And where, one, where might one be able to go to see said costume? It is absolutely fascinating to go into the warehouse. It's when I went in, they had to drag charging. me out. It's really crazy. It's huge. I mean, I mean, some things, you know, I think that when they go out of the show because of copyright reasons and stuff, like sometimes if they build new costumes, they may have to destroy the old ones, but there's a, the warehouse is just absolutely filled with with hats and props in 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a good I've, I've been working with the show for 15 years and I've never been there. Oh, it's, oh. Oh, it's so amazing. Closely you guarded go there. secret. <laughs> and it's, you'll say things like, I need a new pair of shoes because my shoes broke. And they'll be like, oh, okay, we'll be right back. And yeah. they'll go over there and they'll bring back a pair of shoes that are in your size and were even better than the ones that you had before. Because there's just, there's like an entire wall that's Dozens. the size of that wall that's just covered in shoes. They don't throw anything away. Not, you know, it's like everything sort of stays or costumes will be picked apart. And when somebody new comes into the show, you know, everybody's sizes are a little bit different. So they'll find like, oh, well, that bodice will fit her, but she's a little shorter. So maybe we should get a little bit of a shorter skirt so that's not below her knees, you know? And they'll take it apart and they'll build it together. And our costume department is unreal. Phenomenal. I mean, for the New Year's Eve, how long? Two weeks to put like... And the hat, the hat makers. And the hats. I mean, yeah. 20, like Matt 20 James different costumes Andrew. like that, and they just turn them out, and they're the most beautiful things you've ever seen. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> now, is there, uh, was there a big difference coming to Google? I mean, obviously there was, but what was kind of the big difference in the process for bringing it to here as opposed to your stage that you have? That's your um, you always just have to be aware, like, for all these wigs, I mean, Misa's is a little wide, but you want to make sure that you can fit. Like we, I was a, worried about your. We did a rehearsal earlier TV. with because I'm six feet tall. Like I'm already giant, and then you put me in heels and a <laughs> four or five foot hat. It's you know I looked at that and went, oh no problem. And then when we tried to meet, you know go through it, I definitely had to kind of 
do this. So it's, you know, you have to check your surroundings a lot of the time when we get to a new space, wherever it is, whether, okay, am I going upstairs? Am I going up a ramp? Like just, you know, the surroundings, the light, the sound, it all, it just changes from space to space. And you just, you know, we have everything taped out right here. And it's, it's basically the choreography we do on our stage at, at Club Fugazi. We just make it work for whatever space we're in. I think the show teaches you to be on your feet too. You know, Kenny will come to you right before the show and say, you have a new line. And you're like, oh. <laughs> so you have to learn this whole new line or, or a new verse in a song because something happened that day. And so you have to be able to, like, let go of old information and bring in new information and go. <laughs> you know? And, just, and sometimes it's a wing and a prayer. But, I mean, most of us, I mean, I know, I, sometimes I can't even remember things at home. Like, did I do my laundry last night? And it's because... I got too much information coming in. <laughs> and I'm just like, I got to focus on Beach Blanket, you know? Yeah. Memorize those lines. You know, when you get here, we practice it, but then we get here and he says, okay, you go here and you go here, and then you just do it. <laughs> well, and I'm the queen of gibberish. I get, I get new lines, and the show must go on, and I have no idea what I'm saying, and I'm just, that's in bed, and it's in bead, I can be, and it's kosher. Like, I'll finally find, I'll finally find the note, or the, the line I'm supposed to say, and it's actually on YouTube, don't YouTube it. I, um, I was on stage with her when she did that, and she was so committed to her gibberish. There, was, there were people in the audience who said, I, was, I had a really hard time understanding her. Like, they thought she was talking. But you didn't break face either. We didn't break choreography or anything. I was just like, it's in bad, it's in beat, because I was playing Lady Gaga on the meat dress. But I mean, sometimes your mind just goes and you have no idea why, and then all of a sudden it pops back into you, but you just gotta keep going, you know? <laughs> and this, I mean, this show transcends different cities too, because you guys have done this, I think, in London, right? And New York, so, I mean, the res and Vegas, Vegas, I'm sorry. And so, I mean, it's been, how was the reception there? Uh, I don't think any of us were here, but I know that the, both shows were super successful. Um, I'm so jealous. I want to go to London. I know. <laughs> People come, come on, all the Joe. time and they're like, when are you coming back? You know, we want to <laughs> see you in New York. This would do so well, you know? I mean, who knows? Anything is possible for the future, I think. That's good. Next question. Um, hearing you talk about the process, I'm curious about a few things, one of which is how often do performers change and what is the audition process like? Hearing you say all these things with a the theater background, but it does sound like you need to have maybe some sort of improv background or ability to really just remember things and do things on the fly, so I'm curious about that. I actually think I'll speak to that because I'm the only one up here that actually does not have a theater background. I actually used to work here, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, What's really interesting is that Kenny and Joe and just the team, they make it so easy if you just have a lot of personality um, <laughs> to kind of step in and they will help you, you know, and then you have your castmates and you've got a wealth of background in history and theater and they'll help you to kind of guide you along the way. So the audition process, my audition story is a little different from everyone else's, but there actually is an, an annual audition for Beast Blanket Babylon. Typically happens in September. Um, I actually had a private audition because I knew people who knew people. Uh, <laughs> but it's a, really great, um, it's a really great type of a thing because it gives you an opportunity to come in and they'll give you what you need to know. And they'll say, you know, prepare to sing like Barbara. Prepare to sing Am uh, Amos Behaven. Prepare to have a country twang and speak with like a Brit as, as Stephanie does so wonderfully. <laughs> 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 Adele's my favorite, I love her. So, so you have an opportunity to really showcase. So maybe if you don't have that theater background, but you have a lot of personality and a little spark, and they, they will recognize that in you, and they'll give you a chance. They gave me a chance. So. I actually went to the open call. The, fir the first year I auditioned, my grandmother was like, oh, there's a thing in the newspaper, you should go. And I wasn't going to go. I, you know, I just moved home from New York City, and so I didn't prepare anything. And I thought, well, I guess I'll just go. I'm here, I might as well. And I go in, and I had no idea what I was in for. You go into this room, and I didn't know anyone. I mean, I didn't know anyone. I'd never seen the show before. I'd heard about it growing up here. My parents went, but I never saw it. So when I went, and I went up to sing, and I think I was in like the first group, and I went up there, and I sang my solo, which was like maybe this time from Cabaret, you know? And I'm singing my song, and then afterwards he goes, okay, that's great. Now can you do it like Ethel Merman? And I was like, uh... <laughs> I think I can do that. <laughs> and I did my Ethel Merman, and I, I walked out of that audition, and I thought, well, that was bizarre. 
I'd been to like a million auditions in New York and they're just awful. You walk into a room with a table and you sing to them and you leave and you have no idea how you do. And here, Kenny's like, oh my God, I just love it. It's just so great. Can I get more of that? Do it like Barbara now. And now you guys sing together and you do this thing. And you're just like, it's a really like fun environment and you feel like you can just slay it and they're and they want you to succeed and they really don't care if you have a whole lot of experience they just want you to come up there and let go of your inhibitions and go for it it's so different from a theater i mean coming from a theater background and going to this audition was crazy you know sing your song in a brazilian accent <laughs> i mean it, it's true and but it's so fun it's so warm like, like Steph said, in New York, it can be real cold, and they just make it a really lovely, lovely experience. And um, I think you asked, like, how often the cast changes and everything. It really depends. I mean, it's such a wonderful gig as a performer. I mean, we're used to having a, a show last a couple weekends, and then we're out of a job, and we go back to waiting tables. That's what I did in New York, you know? And so to have a job that you have really in, until you want to, you're ready to move on or, you're, or something happens and you're ready to leave, you have a performing job, you know, five nights a week and it's really incredible. So we have people who, sometimes we, they'll have the annual auditions, but people that won't get hired for a couple of years because people haven't leave, left. I mean, Kirk, how, how many years have you yeah, been 15 here? 15 years for me. 15 years. And then Renee, who's one of the stars of the show, almost 30 years. I mean, and it's just, it's wonderful. And you can tell, I mean, the, the people who've been there for so, I mean, everyone is so talented. I work with such a wonderful group of people, but like you, you learn so much from those, those women and men who have been there for so long. I mean, they just, you can just see it on their faces. They just get it. You know what I mean? Like they just totally get this show and it's so wonderful to watch. So that's really interesting too. So do you guys go in with uh, like impressions that you have? Not really. It's like, like Stephanie was saying, it's like I, 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 my audition, I went in and did my song, and he said, great, can you do it like uh, Elvis? Okay, great, can you do it like Richard Simmons? <laughs> yeah, so you just got to be prepared rolling. for anything. Yeah, fly, it's really just fly by the seat of your pants. Just yeah. go for it. Don't worry about it, you know? It's like, maybe this time I'll be lucky. <laughs> you know, it's like you just let it go, and you, and you try. Somehow it works at the end of the day, and they love it for you to go crazier and crazier and crazier, and we'll put something in on the first day, and you know, we're all a little nervous, and, and then after a week of doing it, it's like we're finding more things that you can pull little pieces of these characters in to make it more real for the audience and make them be like, oh my God, she's so like her. You know? <laughs> for my audition, I sang at last, I think, in my second audition because I needed to sing a ballad. And then, you know, I'm singing it and I have my eyes closed. And then Kenny goes, okay, can you sing it with your eyes open? But like you have toothpicks, but be sexy. <laughs> La -la. <laughs> you know, like, Open your eyes, be sexy. It's yeah, one exactly. of our favorite things. It's the funniest like thing. Things. Okay. Open your eyes, be sexy. <laughs> it feels so funny, but it's true. That's beach blanket, you know? <laughs> uh, another question over here. Uh, yeah, so I think you guys just kind of touched on this a little bit already, um, but I am curious, I love that you, the, the guy in the red vest, you play Michelle Bachman. Um, so how like specifically are characters chosen? Like if at night do the producers come and say, you're Vladimir Putin for the night. Um, like how is that decided and is, are there particular characters that everyone wants to play or well, very well, there's, hard to play? I, th there's f 10 principles, five guys, five girls. and out of the principles, they decide who does what. And then the understudies just sort of adapt to what the principles do. And like like I say, I, I cover four people, so I do everything that's not done by a black man or a woman. Um. <laughs> yeah. But there's tracks that's specific. Like mine's, you know, the ban I do Chiquita Banana and Jockey's the Pineapple Princess. So we kind of know which roles come with that. And then it sort of depends on, well, do you have a break right now or are you on state? Okay, you have a break? Okay, so we want you to be, you know, it sort of depends on timing and everything as well. Who can well. make the change. Exactly, who can make the change, yeah. Unless, of course, you're the black girl. Yes. <laughs> In which case, you get to play all of the black roles. So I play, <laughs> my, my principal and I, there are three of us on cast, team black girl. Um, and we play everything from Beyonce to Nicki Minaj to Michelle Obama, Coco Chanel, wrap your head around that one. Um, Tina Turner and Glenda the Good Witch. So there are certain characters, I've always thought of it just, you know, as a newbie coming in, there are tracks that lead to an icon. 
So there's the Louie track. There's the Pineapple Princess track. There's the Pizza Lady track. There's Elvis track. the Elvis track. Because those are the iconic roles that Steve Silver originally created. And then that character then will play some pop culture icons and some political as well. But again, as I said, it's kind of predicated on, do you have a break right now? Do you think you could make a change? You can't? Okay, good. This is you now. You get to play Katy Perry. You get to play... Well, yeah. and like in Jackie's case, I mean, she looks like Kim Kardashian, so obviously they're going to do whatever they can. <laughs> I am not going to play like, Kim Kardashian. You know, it's like she looks fantastic in that role, so they're, they're going to put her in that role. You know, Tammy has just the biggest personality and this big face that has like the craziest facial expressions you've ever seen. So if somebody is bigger than life and has like just this huge, crazy personality, she's going to do it, you know? And they'll figure out how to fit it in. Sometimes it takes a lot of finesse and tweaking and cutting and snipping. But, you know, Kenny and Joe and, and Bill do a fantastic job of figuring out how to fit it in there. And then we sort of show up and go, okay, sure. sounds great. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I do want to, any more questions? One more. Yeah, I, I was reading in the brochure about a, a scholarship program as well. Could you talk to a little bit more about that, how you recruit the next um, generation of folks? I'll take that one. Um, so actually, it's, it's a really wonderful thing. I took place in it a long time ago. Um, it started in 2002, Same. and I was going to college. It was my senior year of high school, and um, they, it's... Is it just Northern California? Is it the Bay Area, Joe? It's the Bay Area. Bay Area. Within and a certain radius of the yes, Bay Area. Yes, there's a certain radius. And they, um, you can audition whether you're a dancer, an actor, or a singer. And you send in a videotape. And it was sort of a, kind of the same thing. I think what you were saying, my mom saw it in the paper. And, and it was like the day before it was due. And OK, let's, in the living room, record you singing you know, a song. And we'll send it in. And so I was one of the three singing finalists chosen. And then it's really, really amazing because I was 17 years old and I got to go to Club Fugazi and I met all the cast and of course I'm like completely overwhelmed and terrified because these people are amazing. And it's a live night, it's, you get to invite friends and there's a panel of judges and each um, finalist performs whatever they've chosen to do, whether it's a dance, acting or singing. And um, a winner is chosen. I did not win, um, but... Uh, Came in second, um, but we the winner about that, though. the winner receives a ten thousand dollars scholarship in each category. So they give thirty thousand dollars away each year, and it's a really amazing program. I mean, it's such, and we watch, we perform at it every year, and we watch these kids, and the talent that comes through is just incredible. I mean, there's been, if you guys watch, so you think you can dance? There was an amazing dancer, Katie. I don't remember her last name. Um, what is it? Sheen. Yes. Yes, she was, she was a finalist, and she won third the place. scholarship. Yeah. Oh, third place. <laughs> no, she, was, she was third on So You Think It Can Dance Oh, there it is. <laughs> but she won the scholarship. the scholarship. And it's a really, really amazing program that, um, that Joe and, and Steve you know, left for her to, to kind of take care of. And it's just such an amazing thing for these, for these kids to be able to come in and have such a huge you know, chunk of change to put towards their college education right away. So... And that's the Beach Blanket Babylon scholarship, scholarship. for the arts, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. So if any of you guys are interested to look it up. Yeah. If you know any high school, like seniors, juniors, it's going to come up this year in June. Let them know. It's a really June 1st. Information's yeah. on the website. Yes. Definitely. Definitely tell them about it. <laughs> well, let's thank the cast one more time for being here. And I do want to make a very special mention to the crew because this is, just doesn't happen. I mean, this is an incredible amount of people involved from Beach Blanket Babylon. So really, really thank you all for being here. The wonderful, wonderful uh, musicians that we have over here. The people in the back who you can't even see who are there helping change the costumes and make sure everything's perfect. And, you know, the costume designers and the wigs and the, especially making the Google hat or the Google wig that's just... Incredible, you know, and of course, Joe, Kenny, all of you guys, thank you so much. Kenny Wade. Joe. Joe Schumann Silver for, you know, really just keeping this show alive in, in San Francisco and, and keeping it alive for 40 years. I mean, this is just incredible and, you know, it's Steve's legacy. So it's really great that it's, it's here, it's here to stay and it's, you know, doing incredible. So we all really, really thank you for that. So go see the show. It's at Club Fagazi, you know, in North Beach District, San Francisco. And uh, we all thank you for being here today. <laughs>